I'm joined by Darren Daniel, who is the Executive Director at Alliance for Coffee Excellence. Welcome, Darren. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. So, Darren, what is the Alliance for Coffee Excellence? Uh, we, well, we're a, a nonprofit organization in our 20th anniversary uh, based in Portland, Oregon. And our mission is to work to empower coffee producers around the world and over 10 countries around the world to provide a competition structure for farmers to enter into a national competition and then bridge them with our membership base, primarily roasters, companies like Starbucks, um, mom and pop, smaller retailer roaster companies, and to, to bridge them into these lots of special coffees that uh, garner pretty high premiums and then sell direct to, the, to those roasters. Um, and this is a discovery mechanism for us to be able to empower farmers. So, so essentially, it's a best of the best of breed that is merit-based, and based on that, the winners are able to get global distribution access that perhaps they wouldn't have had uh, gone otherwise. So let me ask a very fundamental first question, which is, what makes great coffee? Uh, if you get into the methodology and some of the judging and scoring aspects, that would be very helpful. Sure, sure. Uh, well, our founders had incorporated a, a cupping form, much like you would find in a wine analysis like Robert Parker's scoring system. So there are certain attributes that, that um, like body and acidity and balance. And, and these attributes are all quantified uh, into a scoring structure. And there's also a descriptive analysis. So we want to have certain flavor uh, descriptors that can be shared a common language with other uh, people in the world that would understand uh, certain flavors. And, and so the scoring and the descriptive analysis allows us to create a, a scoring structure uh, with a, a pool of jurists from around the world that come and then quantify the quality of the coffee through a calibrated jury. Sometimes the juries are comprised of 12, 13 different countries of individuals that are uh, uh, sensory professionals who um, explore all those coffees and attributes. And then we put those scores together and then rank the top coffees based on their quality. And then at that point, those coffees that are at the highest scoring coffees move on to, um, to what would be our auction platform. Um, but it, it's the forum is a way to create a common language for us to understand what industry standards are and what quality really means. And, and it, it kind of is ushered into the commercial market, but especially into the specialty coffee market, which is kind of where we, we hover as, a, as an industry. So I would imagine all of this is based on variety and specific type of coffee. So everything has its own set of scoring and a certain benchmark that they have to hit. So the question I have is, in terms of the what you what the judges would consider the best of the best, is that a relativity, relativity in terms of scoring or is there a concrete benchmark that indicates for this variety or varietal here are the characteristics that it needs to hit yeah there you know inherently it it the the analysis is somewhat subjective but through the form we try to create an objective uh you know a series of objective metrics so that when we calibrate a jury if we find something that's a very elevated coffee, we, we usually get consensus. So the, these individuals are very good at, at analyzing coffees uh, to be able to give uh, these scores in an appropriate manner where we, we know that, uh, let's say it's a certain variety that people are very excited about, like a Pacamara variety or a Geisha variety, which is an heirloom variety from Ethiopia. Um, there'll be kind of a group think and a, and a group assessment uh, towards those quality. And also it goes through many, many different phases. There's a national jury of experienced cuppers that taste and vet the coffees through two different phases before the international jury comes together. And then at that point, um, the, the international group um, who has a lot of global experience tasting coffees kind of puts their stamp of approval on the final phase. So, so it goes through quite a, quite a bit of scrutiny and vetting. So. Now, of course, uh, one of the things we have to be mindful is when we're talking about agricultural commodities, it's subject to changes in climate, changes in water conditions, soil conditions. So you could have a winner in one year, but subsequent years, they might not necessarily be uh, follow on in winners because of varying uh, sets of you know, conditions. So really, the question is, why is it so important to continually test and rate the world's best coffee? And the question I'm really getting at is, how does it really benefit the local farmers and growers? Sure, sure. Yeah, correct on the, the like issues around climate and how one season a region might be benefiting very well with uh, appropriate rainfall or good uh, blooming of flower before the onset of, of the coffee. 
um, that might change. And, and um, it, it does, we do have people that do great in one year and then struggle because of other, other issues where they, they have even, even just logistical issues and infrastructure, getting coffees um, in Papua New Guinea somewhere or in East Africa uh, to a warehouse might be a difficult challenge or drying or a host of other uh, things that can uh, come into it. But the, the process that we have is really, uh, it is a quality uh, competition, but what it does is it opens the door to market access so that these producers can leverage being a winner or being in part of our program to try to leverage higher premiums for larger amounts of coffee. And we have a lot of studies that have been done by um, other NGOs like Technoserve to show that by Farmers being in our program, they've been able to actually garner higher prices, gain access to new markets, especially Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, China. Um, the, these are producers that really normally didn't have that much linkage. So our program is kind of a, um, a catapult towards, uh, uh, I guess, more more power in their hands to be able to negotiate higher prices and, and also uh, to build best practices. So farmers learn from the program and the process and they learn from their other producers and neighbors that if they uh, employ better measures, they, they may be able to get higher prices for a larger amount of their volume. Now you may not necessarily have the scientific data to back this up per se, but I'm curious to know uh, for some time, uh, several decades, uh, fair trade and sustainable coffee has been a fairly important theme uh, in terms of branding and positioning for many coffee brands as well as the distribution and retailers. How does that correlate with great coffee? And does having fair trade and sustainability make better coffee? Well, you know, it, uh, it, there have been a lot of studies showing have we moved the needle um, in, in the bigger picture of, of the industry through uh, certification, through fair trade or Rainforest Alliance or 4C. And, and it's certainly the case has been made that um, many, many organizations, especially cooperatives, have benefited through uh, certification. And it resonates with consumers. Consumers understand organic. They understand uh, fair trade. They, 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 they want to rally and be loyal to these certifications because they believe that they are doing and making improvements at, at origin and at the farm level. And when we look up, when we look at it against the commodified market and the sea market, which has been you know, suffering pretty badly over the four or five year window, it's very hard for those certifications to overcome uh, the commodification of, of coffee. And even, even in these more um, boutique segments or organic segments, um, it, it, there's a lot more mechanics involved and uh, market uh, crosswinds that make it difficult. But I think a great amount of effort has been made and there has been some success. Okay. So on the topic of commoditizing coffee and how that has a downward pressure on costs and ultimately the kinds of profit or wage that translates into the actual uh, owners, but not only the owners of those farms, but also the workers of those farms. Um, so the question that I have is, with potential changes or severity in climate change effects over the coming decades, how is that going to affect quality? How is that going to affect sustainability, supply, and ultimately um, the bottom line for these growers and local local workers? Well, unfortunately, the, the ripple effect is, is not uh, leveraging the farmers in the right way because they're unable to, uh, because of their cost of production, they're unable to put adequate inputs back into the soil um, to do renovation, which is critical for higher output in the long term. So they're faced with, with really tough challenges in terms of uh, being able to try to attempt uh, to improve their quality when they're faced with uh, such razor thin margins. Um, uh, the, the lack of labor in some of the supply chains, uh, especially in Central America, uh, where there's just not adequate labor to be able to pick, um, especially currently when we see what's going on with the COVID crisis and hearing reports in Peru and, and Colombia of uh, coffee being on the tree and left on the tree because there's not adequate labor. So it, it's very damaging, uh, to, be, to be really honest. So it, it's an uphill battle right now. So, Okay. Now, at the timing of this uh, recording, it's uh, mid-April. And of course, most of the world is uh, in one way or another in lockdown. How is that affecting the cup of excellence competition? And how are you guys navigating in spite of the global uh, quarantine? 
Um, well, it, it's, we've had to pivot pretty heavily uh, because we are a global organization that, that uh, takes uh, our member base and, and moves them to all of the, the countries where we work. And we've had to completely stop that process. And we've had to create uh, global coffee uh, hubs and centers where we can do the jury process in over five different countries. So we've modified it so that we can still move and back our farmers and still uh, move towards the auction. So th this has been one of the main pivots that we've had to do. And we've had to employ safe measures to be able to do tasting in, in small groups instead of having large groups, like we would have 24 uh, sensory panelists. Now we're working in subgroups of three to four clusters so that we can be safe and have sanitary environments. Um, we've been uh, employing those measures and, and socializing them to the other hubs that we're starting to build. Those hubs are made up of people that are uh, have been lifelong Uh, jurists and and uh, quite quite professional in what they're doing. So, uh, the idea of globalizing it has turned into um, there's a little bit of innovation around the fact that we've had to pivot so quickly, and our member base uh, is, is very supportive, um, and we hope that they they will, uh, given the situation, uh, be able to you know come to the auction platform and really and really enhance by by bidding and and continuing the process. So. It's interesting how uh, constraints and scarcity uh, forces us to innovate. And it sounds like you guys have really tried hard to adapt and it looks like you guys are doing well. Anything that we should know in terms of the kind of the upcoming year or so, whether it's around supply or kinds of quality effects uh, of coffee because of the lockdown? Well, it's a very fluid situation right now. And what we're seeing is... Uh, Uh, two things. We're seeing uh, some reports, like I had mentioned, about Colombia and Peru with uh, potentially coffee being left on the tree. But then we're hearing other reports in Honduras and Guatemala of increased contracts. So there may be a little bit of uh, roasters and other companies uh, wanting to stock up on green coffee, which is good news for producers when they thought maybe their volumes might be a little bit lower. So I, I think that that's positive news. And, uh, you know, the sea market and Coffee has been actually trending up over the last four or five days. Uh, also good news. And maybe that sense of scarcity might pull the market up a little bit higher, give uh, farmers more hope uh, towards, towards uh, the end of this summer where we see coffee shipments leaving the country. And more importantly, you know, we, we always would recommend supporting your small businesses, your small retailer roasters, the cafes, the frontline people that are out there that, that have been most impacted on the consuming side. And by, by supporting them and by uh, looking to them uh, to, to you know, purchase your coffee and move forward, you're really helping them, who really is our main member base, to, to kind of get through the situation and, and back the farmers and, and get back to normalcy. Yep. So how can people find out more about your organization and the competitions? Oh, sure. Yes. Um, our website is the Alliance for Coffee Excellence.org. And uh, you can find our program there, the Cup of Excellence, which we own and operate on that website. And to get further information, COVID updates, uh, our auction dates coming forward this summer are all on that website. So today I've been joined by Darren Daniel with Alliance for Coffee Excellence. Thanks for joining today. Thank you so much.